best to uh, make that happen. Okay, this is Rick Linderoff at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and thank you, Megan, and thanks, Sam, for joining me, and thanks to all of you for participating in this webinar. This is the first time I've experienced a webinar on this end, the speaking end, so uh, so far everything seems to be going well. So uh, yes, I'll be speaking specifically about uh, defenses of aspen against herbivory and uh, effects of uh, these defense compounds on herbivores. and. Uh, the outline for my talk, and I see already my, my keyboard is not advancing the slides, Megan, so let me try this. There we go. The arrows work. Uh, I'll be talking specifically about uh, some aspects of the natural history of aspen, particularly in relationship to herbivory, and then uh, focus on chemical defenses and sources of variation in those chemical defenses, those, so, those sources being genetic, environmental, and developmental. And then address the issue of costs and environmental, con, environmental contingency of those costs of defense. And then conclude with uh, some examples of the effects of various defense compounds on both insect and mammalian, mammalian herbivores. And then I'll hand it off to Sam uh, St. Clair who will talk about defenses at the community and landscape uh, scale. So uh, let's get started with a little bit of background about aspen. As I'm sure most of you are aware, it's a foundation species in many forest ecosystems across North America. It has uh, extraordinary genetic variation. It's considered to be one of the most uh, genetically variable plant species known to science and also has great environmental plasticity, that is, uh, depending on resource availability, um, biotic interactions, etc., uh, there can be significant impacts on the growth and physiology, chemical composition of uh, aspen trees. That combination of genetic and environmental plasticity means that we have very strong G by E, or gene by environment interactions, that influence the expression of various aspen phenotypes. Aspen has extensive spatial and temporal distribution. It occurs from Alaska to Mexico and from the Pacific to the Atlantic. And uh, individual aspen clones have been, uh, have been uh, known to live for thousands, if not perhaps tens of thousands of years, especially in areas of the uh, Intermountain West. Aspen is a species, serves as a host to at least 150 different species of uh, herbivores, mostly insects, but also a number of mammals and birds. Now, as I'm sure most of you are aware, ungulate browsing is contributing to very poor regeneration of aspen stands throughout much of the interior west of North America. The slide in the bottom left, left is taken at uh, Rocky Mountain National Park. Those aspen trees, if you can call them that, they look like bushes, are probably decades old and have not yet reached higher than knee height due to extensive browsing by elk. And on the right, the larger photo is a, an elk grazing lawn. This is a photo taken near Banff uh, in Canada uh, in the Bow River Valley. You can see there's very little, if any, aspen regeneration occurring in this aspen stand. In addition, insects can contribute to aspen dieback as well. On the left, uh, an example of forest tent caterpillar defoliation and successive years of defoliation can, can, can contribute to uh, 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 crown dieback, as well as in the lower right, uh, a case of um, uh, sad uh, in the uh, uh, Intermountain West where bark beetles in combination with drought in particular are contributing to uh, decline of aspen stands. So aspen clones, uh, though they are subject to extensive herbivory, are not uniformly susceptible to attack. And that's true with respect to both uh, browsing mammals and insects. So here on the left, we see uh, a photo of the Cedar Mountain area in Utah. And the clone in the foreground has fairly extensive un uh, understory uh, regeneration occurring. Whereas the clone in the up in the back, and let's see if I can find my arrow. Here we go. Uh, the clone in the back has a very little regeneration occurring. 
In controlled feeding studies that we've done in my research group uh, with deer and elk, we can see that uh, different genotypes are differently susceptible to browsing by both elk and deer. On the left is a resistant clone, and on the right is a non-resistant uh, clone. The same is true of insect herbivores, especially a number of outbreak herbivores. In this slide, uh, the, let me hold, hold on here one second, grab my, my arrow doesn't seem to be working again. All right, we'll forego the arrow. The, uh, the slide on the lower left shows a forest tent caterpillar outbreak. Aspen trees are not uniformly susceptible to defoliation by tent caterpillars until the outbreak gets quite severe. And the, true is, the same is true, there we go, there's my arrow. Uh, the same is true of uh, gypsy moths. Okay, bear with me for one minute because I'm trying to grab my little green arrow and it's stuck on the perimeter, not allowing me to grab it. So I'm going to try one more time and then I'll... No, nope, seems to be stuck. All right, we'll forego the arrow. So the research that my group has been involved with now for several decades with Aspen has been addressing uh, the causes and consequences of variation in Aspen chemical composition. We've been interested in a number of phenotypic traits of Aspen, growth and chemical defenses in particular, and then how a combination of factors such as genetics, environment, and development influence those phenotypic traits. The, uh, the interaction of genetics and environment is what we know as phenotypic plasticity. That is, different genotypes can express different um, uh, phenotypes under different environments. And then we've also been interested in the consequences of variation in those phenotypic traits, again, particularly chemical defenses, on trophic interactions, that is, interactions with insects and to some extent mammals as well, and how those in turn influence community structure and various ecosystem processes, such as nutrient cycling. I'll be focusing today primarily on genetic and environmental factors and their impacts on chemical defenses and then consequences for trophic interactions with insects and mammals. So uh, again, to summarize, our questions are, are largely, uh, our research uh, involves primarily two questions. That is, how do genetics, environment, development, and their interactions influence herbivore defense in Aspen? And secondarily, what are the consequences of variation in plant chemistry for both insect and mammalian herbivores. Now Aspen produces a variety of phenylpropanoid based or phenolic based defense compounds, but these are primarily in two major classes of uh, secondary compounds. Those are the phenolic glycosides, sometimes also known as salicylates or salicinoids, shown on the lower left. An example of that is tremulasin. These are structurally similar to aspirin. And then on the right, large polyphenolic compounds that we know as condensed tannins. So these are the major secondary plant compounds produced as defense agents in Aspen. A couple of general characteristics of these defense compounds includes they have relatively low potency. That is, they're not highly toxic, but they exist at fairly high concentrations from uh, anywhere from 1 up to 20, sometimes 25 percent of the dry weight of a leaf can consist of these compounds. They have low specificity, or in other words, they are, they are broad spectrum. Uh, they attack a number of different target sites, and so they've shown to be active against herbivores, against uh, fungal organisms. Among the herbivores, they're active against birds, against mammals, and insects. Now, I didn't have time today to uh, go into a number of other forms of defense that Aspen utilizes as well, uh, but I do want to just mention those. Uh, for example, there is tolerance, that's the stand there and take it strategy. So certain genotypes appear to have evolved strategies to tolerate browsing and to 
bounce back from that browsing damage um, more effectively than other genotypes. And then there is simply vertical growth, which is effective against mammalian herbivores because they can, once they reach up to 8 to 10 feet in height, they can escape the browsing um, damage from large ungulates. All right, well, let's move on now and take a look at variation in asthma defense compounds. And this first slide shows variation in levels of phenolglycosides among 31 randomly selected Aspen clones in northwest uh, Colorado. And the main point of this slide is that there's extraordinary genotypic or clonal variation. Uh, as those Aspen clones vary in, con in concentrations of phenolglycosides anywhere from 5 up to 30 percent. And similarly, condensed tannins are also highly variable among Aspen clones, again, ranging from roughly 5, in this case, up to close to 20 percent of uh, foliar dry weight. So my group has done a number of studies over the years uh, in controlled environments and also some in the field looking at genetic and environmental and G by E effects on expression of defense in Aspen. So we've considered, for example, light levels, uh, soil fertility, drought, uh, prior damage, uh, CO2 levels, ozone levels, a whole host of various environmental factors, and uh, their consequences for uh, chemical composition of uh, Aspen. And I'll show some of those slides here, just a couple of um, summary slides. In each of these slides, each line represents a different genotype, or think of it as a different uh, clone. And so on the left, we see, I think we have seven, eight different clones uh, grown under low light conditions, those same clones grown under high light conditions. And then within each panel on the left, we have low and high soil fertility. And again, the same on the right, low and high uh, soil fertility. The take home message with phenolic glycosides shown in this first slide is that most of the variation that we see is genotypic. That is, most of the variation is in the vertical dimension, that is, uh, differences among clones. There is some effect of light. Uh, high light levels do enhance production of phenolic glycosides somewhat. And there's very little impact uh, of soil fertility on production of phenolic glycosides. Now, this is in contrast to the other major defense compounds, the condensed tannins, which are shown in this slide, where there are strong gene by environment interactions. That is, the different genotypes express themselves quite differently depending on the environment they're, that they are in. So, under conditions of low light, there is very little production of condensed tannins. That production goes way up for some genotypes, but not all, under conditions of high light. And in general, high soil fertility tends to reduce tannin production. Now, Aspen also strong, exhibits very strong developmental or ontogenetic trajectories in the expression of defense compounds, both in the uh, Great Lakes area and in the Intermountain West. We've done surveys where we've We've basically run transects through clones, starting at the periphery with very young ramets and extending toward the middle with much older ramets, and then quantified uh, various aspects of tissue chemistry uh, along those transects. And those results are shown in the right graph. And you can see that levels of phenolic glycosides decline uh, quite precipitously, especially with uh, the early age classes of, uh, of Aspen. That is not a uniform scale on the bottom uh, x-axis. The first point is 0 to 1, and the second is 2 to 5 years. So there's quite a bit of a drop in levels of these compounds in the first several years of, of growth of an aspen ramet. And then they tend to level off in uh, more mature trees. And conversely, we see that levels of condensed tannins are very low in young ramets, and then climb steadily, uh, max maximizing out around 16 uh, in older trees, even closer to 20 percent in uh, these aspen clones. We see the similar basic trends in the Great Lakes region, although here we see a much more precipitous drop in levels of phenolic glycosides in young age trees. And older trees contain lower levels than do trees in the Intermountain West. So to summarize then, in terms of the effects of various environmental factors and genetic factors on phenolic glycosides and tannins, we see that both phenolic glycosides and tannins are strongly determined by genetic uh, composition. 
Phenolic glycosides are only marginally affected by resource availability, whereas condensed tannins are strongly affected. Both condensed tannins and phenolic glycosides are strongly affected by developmental stage. Phenolic glycosides are only marginally affected by prior herbivore damage, which I've not talked about, uh, whereas condensed tannins are more significantly affected by prior damage. Well, do these defenses exact a cost? Are they expensive to produce in Aspen? And are those expenses uniform across environments, or do they vary? We've run a series of studies, a number of different experiments, looking at the cost of defense, again, mostly in young aspen trees, although not entirely. And what we found is that, indeed, these, uh, the defenses are costly to produce in terms of the consequences for growth, and that the magnitude of cost is strongly environmentally determined. So in this set of graphs, what we see, each point represents a different clone, uh, probably seven to, t to 10 different trees. And under conditions of low light, low fertility, low light, high fertility, and high light and low fertility, that is the, the boxes in the upper and then lower left of the uh, figures, show that uh, there's a strong negative genetic correlation between tree uh, weight and production of phenolic glycosides. But under conditions of high light and high fertility, that is when resources are abundant, that, uh, that trend still exists, but the significance breaks down. In other words, when resources are super abundant, that is light and soil fertility are abundant, the cost of uh, production of these phenolic glycosides is minimized. We see similar results with much larger trees in field situations. We've been um, plotting uh, and uh, assessing growth and chemistry of aspen planted out as young saplings in a common environment uh, now for about 12 years near Madison, Wisconsin. And consistently, we see that uh, allocation to chemical defenses accounts for roughly 30 to 50 percent of the variation in growth among genotypes in this common garden. So what are the impacts of these chemical defenses on herbivores? We've done a number of different feeding studies, and I'll show a few examples with insects and with mammals. But uh, so far, we know that these uh, compounds, especially the phenolic glycosides, reduce the preference and or performance of a number of insect species, including both uh, generalist insects and specialists, and a number of mammals, such as elk, deer, mountain hare, and porcupine. The phenolic glycosides have also been shown to be effective in um, combating uh, fungal pathogens such as hypoxyl and canker. So uh, let's move on and look at uh, results for a number of uh, different feeding studies. In this first slide, we see that the fitness in terms of survivorship of gypsy moth larvae can range from 0 to 100 percent on different aspen clones. And that uh, difference in survivorship is strongly correlated with phenolic glycoside production. In this graph, we see that uh, the weight of, of uh, gypsy moths is strongly and inversely proportional to phenolic glycoside levels in their food. Each point here represents a different aspen clone and probably a couple of dozen different insects. And here, uh, phenolic glycosides explain fully, fully 98% of the variation in insect size. And we can also see that phenolic glycosides account for much of the variation in defoliation rates uh, by gypsy moths on aspen. Moving on to mammals, we've done some um, kind of preliminary studies, uh, not detailed, but enough to give us um, some interesting results showing that phenolic glycosides also deter feeding by elk. These were captive elk, elk in uh, southern Utah. And we've done more extensive work looking at the impact of plant chemistry on white-tailed deer feeding. And interestingly here, although we found that there are strong uh, preferences shown by deer for different aspen genotypes, as in this slide, not, not so much a, a preference for the soil nutrient conditions, but strong preferences for different genotypes, that uh, those preferences are determined less so by the defense compounds and more strongly by mineral concentrations, as is shown here in these figures showing correlation plots with uh, shoot number of shoots browsed 
and the uh, shoot sodium, calcium, and magnesium content. So the question then comes up, why are these chemical defenses seemingly ineffective in some natural environments or under some conditions? As we know is true throughout much of the Intermountain West under heavy ungulate grazing and during uh, outbreaks of uh, tent caterpillars and gypsy moths in the Great Lakes region. And I believe the answer to that is that high herbivore population densities simply overwhelm aspen defenses. Uh, as the proverbs say to the hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. So some take home messages and then I'll hand off to Sam. Aspen chemical defenses are highly variable in response to various genetic, environmental, uh, and developmental factors and interactions thereof. Different compounds are differentially affected. Tannins and phenolic glycosides are not uniformly affected uh, in the same way. Genetic variation in defense levels is likely maintained in populations because of spatial and tempor temporal and developmental variation in their costs and benefits. And this, this aspen chemistry uh, will determine levels of damage by insects and mammals, but that, uh, that variation in damage is uh, exhibited primarily under low to moderate herbivore densities. Under very high densities, everything gets eaten. Uh, you're better off eating bad aspen than uh, spruce trees, for example. Which then leads to our recommendation that efforts to employ aspen natural defense capacities in restoration projects should be encouraged but they'll likely prove ineffective without simultaneous control of herbivore population densities. And finally, further understanding of the genetic basis and environmental modification of defense systems in Aspen will aid in generating predictive models for herbivory risk. And with that, I'll hand back to Megan, Megan or off to Sam. Hey Rick, we have a question from Dave. Um, do either of the de defense compounds, are they present in the bark? Uh, good question, Dave. Yes, indeed they are. Uh, we've measured uh, bark and roots, uh, levels in the bark, and levels in the roots are lower than in the leaves, but both uh, tannins and uh, phenolic glycosides certainly do exist in the, um, in the cambial tissue, the exterior bark, as well as roots. Great. And then Adam has a question. I'm not sure if you can see that, but is the concentration of either compound oh, induced I do by see browsing? That. Yeah, good question, Adam. We've done a lot of work on that. The, tan the tannins are more inducible than phenolic glycosides. Tannins can be induced uh, in the current year by damage to leaves, and they tend to be higher in the year following damage. Phenolic glycosides, we've, we have mixed results. They're not real strongly induced, but they are marginally induced. With the phenolic glycosides, though, we feel that the genotypic variation swamps whatever induction occurs. Although that's that's still uh, a matter of some uh, of interest in the lab. Sure, you're welcome. Great. All right, Rick. Thank you so much for that. And then we might we might have some more questions All at right, the I'm end, but I'll let I'll you mute go my ahead mic. Perfect. All right, and then Sam will get started. Um, and which has been really valuable as we have asked ecological questions uh, at the landscape scale. <clears throat> I wanted to start uh, my portion of the webinar uh, by looking at, at the forests we work in. Uh, so this is a mixed aspen fir forest on the Fish Lake National Forest. And I want to point out something that, that Rick mentioned, um, which is that, that aspen is a foundational species, that it, it structures the forest, uh, especially in the Intermountain West. It's a pioneering species, so it, it regenerates quickly after disturbance. And, and then it structures um, the rest of the biological community. And you can see that here um, just a little bit, that the forest margin is actually defined by the aspen. These aspen trees are about 30 or 40 years older than, than these fir uh, trees. And uh, what's interesting is, is the fir seeds will land in these meadows at the, at the forest margin, but they generally don't germinate. Um, but once disturbance occurs and the root systems uh, sucker up following disturbance, then uh, the, the other conifer tree, uh, tree species will march out with the aspen. And if you walk into these forests, what you'll find is that establishment of the conifer species is, is not random. 
that often they establish right next to the aspen trees themselves. Um, this is called facilitation, where one species helps another species establish. Uh, and, and that's going to become important in some of the things that I'm going to highlight here in my presentation. Um, what we found is that this facilitation effect where the, the conifer species are in close proximity to the aspen over time, um, the shade tolerant conifers grow rapidly and then begin to compete with the aspen, um, and, which can create a lot of mortality uh, over time. And, and the ecological driver that actually balances out this relationship is fire. So as the conifers grow and begin to overtop the aspen and compete with them, um, creating mortality, that increase, increases uh, the flammability of the stands. And, and at some point, a fire will occur, and the conifers are very flammable. And uh, following fire, the aspen root system uh, will regenerate and start the cycle over again. So I want to just run through a conceptual model of how these, these forests work. Uh, you have aspen, uh, which establish following disturbance. They facilitate the conifers. At some point, uh, fire uh, will create um, a disturbance. And the aspen will then restart the cycle by regenerating. Um, and, and what's problematic is, as Rick mentioned, uh, one of the defense strategies for aspen is to actually escape herbivory for, through vertical growth. Um, and following a disturbance, um, the aspen is very vulnerable uh, to herbivory at that point. Um, historically, uh, we didn't have livestock on our forest landscapes, and wildlife uh, densities were much lower. And so that's created a, a challenge for us in some areas, how to deal with this. Um, this is an area on Monroe Mountain in central Utah, where you can see there was a timber harvest about 15 years ago. You can see it's a uh, mixed aspen conifer forest. And immediately after the, the, the disturbance created by the timber harvest, the aspen regenerated um, vigorously um, with the existing root system that was in place. Um, but with heavy herbivore pressure, um, there was intensive browsing in this area, and for a three or four year period that the root system continued to send aspen suckers up, um, and, and at some point the herbivory pressure was too much, the root system lost its vigor, and the aspen didn't regenerate. And 15 years later we can see the effects of that. Um, not only did we lose the aspen, we lost the other associated uh, tree species that are facilitated by aspen. And this area is, is transitioned from an aspen conifer forest to kind of a degraded grass forbland. Uh, so angular communities are changing at a global scale. Um, this is partially driven by um, extirpation of keystone predators or, or, or uh, and also increases in ungulate populations, uh, native ungulates, and then the introduction of, of exotic ungulates into um, many of our, our Earth's ecosystems. Uh, we were really interested in, in actually separating out the effects of the different uh, ungulate communities or, or populations. And part of this is driven by their physiology, um, that they're, they're um, traits related to how they digest, the room in size, uh, the amount of material they can take in, and their capacity to, type, to digest it. And part of it is their morph mouth morphology, um, how large their mouth is, and that influences uh, their selectivity. What they, they select for and, and how they actually consume uh, the plant material. Um, so deer uh, tend to have smaller mouth sizes, a smaller room to body ratio, and so they tend to be more selective uh, than, than, than a cow, for example. So as I mentioned previously, in a post-disturbance environment, as the aspen suckers up, it's more vulnerable to herbivory. You can see here the, the, the aspen root system and the suckering um, in a post-disturbance environment. And what we found uh, in areas where there is as high ungulate density is aspen is utilized in burnt landscapes, as seen here. So two research questions. Uh, how do ungulate community characteristics relate to aspen regeneration success? And, and we find areas where it's, it's really problematic and areas in which uh, aspen's regenerating really well. 
Um, and, and so we're really interested in, in what are the environmental drivers that influence Aspen defense um, that, that uh, result in these different outcomes? And what are the ecological conditions that increase Aspen resistance uh, to herbivory? So we set up. Hey, Sam, I'm going to have you, before you go on, I'm just going to have you move the microphone a little bit away from your mouth. Either that or um, use the down button next to your microphone to just adjust microphone volume and lower it a little bit. And then if people have a problem hearing you, they can turn up their own volume, but it's a little loud um, on our end. So sorry to interrupt you. That that's, better? A, that's better, yeah. Let me know. Thank you. Uh, we, we set up um, in, in uh, an, an, an experiment in 2012 uh, where we were really interested in, in looking at the density effects of, of ungulates, wildlife, and livestock, and then separating out their effects. Uh, and so we, we set up this uh, fencing design uh, where we have a livestock fence that, uh, that exclude the livestock but allow wildlife to jump in. We have a deer-only fence, um, which is, is a full wildlife fence, but it has a half-meter gap at the bottom that deer can crawl under. excludes the elk and the cattle. They're just too large to, to get under the gap. And then we have full exclosures uh, here at the bottom uh, that exclude everything. Um, and that gives us four uh, different treatments. Uh, access for, for the entire ungulate community, wildlife only, deer only, and then uh, experimental plots, control plots, where we, we have no fencing, where all the entire un uh, ungulate community has access. Um, and then within these experimental plots, uh, we're doing pellet counts. And we also have uh, motion and, and heat-activated cameras so that we, we, we specifically know the animals that are entering into these experimental plots. And then we go in and uh, we have a grid system for characterizing uh, the amount of browsing that's occurring and also defoliation or, or removal of the leaves. Uh, so here's our full exclosure. It's a two meter fence uh, with no gap at the bottom that excludes all uh, ungulates. Um, here's our deer only fence it has the gap at the bottom um, that allows deer in and excludes the other uh, ungulates. Uh, here's our, our livestock fence that excludes livestock but, but allows um, the, the wildlife to, to enter by jumping over. And then here's a control plot with, with open access to all ungulates in the community. And we set up uh, the, these four-way uh, exclosure experiments at four different sites um, from central to southern Utah. Uh, three of the, the fires occurred in 2012. In the Sealy Fire, we have three of these four-way exclosures. The Box Creek Flop Fire, we have uh, three also. And then in the Horse Valley Fire, which occurred in 2009, uh, we have two four-way exclosures, and Shingle Mill also has two exclosures. And um, I want to show you some of the camera data. And this is where I'm going to go to a video. And um, what, what I'm interested in you seeing here are, are the changes in ungulate use um, across the season. You see, that was June. We had about 10 animals that entered this experimental plot. This is an open plot with no exclusion. And as we transition into July, you can see at the top that the time stamp. So we're uh, July 11th at this point. Um, and what you're going to see through the month of July is, is a lot of wildlife activity. And a lot more animals uh, than in June. So this is valuable in, in helping us to know which animals are in, entering into the plots. Um, based on, on, on the way we're capturing the camera data, uh, we can get some a sense of behavior. Are they eating the aspen or not? Um, how intensively are they utilizing uh, the aspen suckers? And here now we're in August, uh, you're going to see much more of uh, a livestock influence and presence. And we all can also get information about when 
uh, during the day, uh, they're browsing, whether they're um, more active during the day or at night. And here I'm going to go back to the presentation. And here's the data um, that I just showed you for, for all of our plots. And, and what you can see here is that in June uh, we have only wildlife and, and, and uh, the activity is very low. Um, July continues with uh, the trend of, of wildlife activity um, with a lot of elk. And then in August uh, we, we begin to see the livestock coming into the system and, and having an effect. Um, and then here's another video I want to show that is, is actually the same video with the animals removed so that we can focus on the, the regeneration response of the aspen. Um, so you can see early on in the summer the, the aspen begin to, to grow vertically. They put out their leaves. And then about mid-summer, you can see the defoliation that begins to occur. And instead of growing vertically, which we, we see in control or exclusion plots, we actually lose height on, on the aspen suckers as they're trying to grow and, and escape from, from the herbivores. And I'm going to show you now just, just the, the Aspen response data. So here's height data. This is for 2014. Um, and, and we're really interested in, in the time effects. So let me just orient you on the different treatment effects. And I've, I've organized them by, by what has access. Um, so right here, the, the circular uh, symbols uh, that are filled, um, this is full exclusion. No animals have access. The squares. Uh, deer have access only, um, and then the triangles deer and elk have access, and then the crosses uh, all ungulates, the livestock and wildlife have access to, to the experimental plots. And what we can see is that um, the aspen, especially during the early summer period, grow pretty rapidly, and then uh, in, in the August-September period they plateau in terms of their height response. And in all experimental treatments, except for uh, full access plots, um, there, there's sustained growth through early summer that then plateaus in, in uh, the late summer. Where there, there's full access, where all un the entire ungulate community has access to the experimental plot, is really where we see a difference, um, where we see a loss of, of height on the aspen that was gained earlier in the summer. And by the time we get to the end of September, um, they've lost up to, to half of their vertical growth. And here's the, the meristem or the bud removal percent. Uh, and what's interesting here is that we can see the residual effect from 2013 uh, in which there's an intermediate effect of deer and deer and elk and, and, and the full effect where you can get up to 90% uh, meristem removal where there's full access uh, for the ungulate community. Um, and then as the plants begin to grow, the aspen begin to grow, there's recovery in, in the early summer period. And then again, um, as we see more animals come uh, into the experimental plots, there's an intermediate effect of the deer and the deer and elk. And then when you have a combination of wildlife and livestock is when we get our more, most serious effects uh, in, in the treatments. There's the average defoliation. So just loss of leaf area. And again, we see an intermediate effect of, of the wildlife communities and, and a much stronger additive effect uh, when you add the, the wildlife and the livestock into the system, where we're getting up to 50, 60 percent of defoliation. Of course, these are the solar panels that, that drive photosynthesis um, that sustains these, uh, the physiology of uh, this, the, the stems and also 
provides resources to, to keep the root system vigorous. Ultimately, what we're interested in knowing is, is recruitment success. So can these aspen, uh, following disturbance, grow vertically to a point that they can escape the mouths of the, of the herbivore community? And what we're finding is that um, it's only with the additive effects of the wildlife and ungulate communities that we're not seeing vertical escape from year to year. So here's 2013. Here's the, the full exclusion plots, the deer only plots, the deer and elk plots. And uh, as we transition to 2014, you can see that there's vertical growth. Um, there's progress towards vertical es escape. But that's not the case in, in uh, the, the non-fenced plots, the full access plots. So there was no increase in vertical growth from 2013 to 2014. Um, so like Rick, we, we been very interested in defense compounds and the effects of phenol glycosides and, and tannins on um, herbivory patterns and whether there's a, a deterrence effect. Uh, this is a feeding trial that we did with sheep. We collected uh, leaf material, aspen leaf material, from two different clones, one that was highly defended, um, that being the, the red line, and one that was more poorly defended or had lower levels of phenol glycosides. This is just a cafeteria trial. Uh, we, we offer the sheep whatever they want to eat, and then we, we follow what, uh, what they select. And in the first week of the experiment, you see no difference in terms of their selectivity for these two different clones. Um, but, but they learn. And, and then their feeding behavior changes in the second period. And you can see that they, they are actively selecting for the, the more poorly defended um, clonal material. And here's some data um, where we actually did a, another cafeteria type, type trial, feeding trial, where we offered on the sheep aspen uh, a nitrogen cyst fixing four, but pea species, and then smooth brown grass. And, and these were all collected out in, in aspen understories up Logan Canyon. And what we found is that in early summer, um, they, they preferred the forb and the, the grass much more than they prefer the aspen. Um, they're, they're, the percent of their, their diet or the proportion of their diet um, was much more strongly in favor of, of the pea and the smooth brome grass. And then as you progress through midsummer and especially in late summer, you see um, that they have a, a much higher prefer for, a preference for aspen as the summer progresses. So that by the end of summer, late summer, about half of what they're selecting is aspen. And as we looked at changes in nutritional quality of the aspen, the pea and the smooth brome grass over the summer, you see that aspen maintains its nutritional quality. We're looking at crude protein content here. And that as we go through from July, the, the blue bars into August, the red bars, and green into September, that aspen actually maintains its nutritional quality. And this is true for nitrogen and some of the other nutrients as well. And uh, in contrast, Utah pea and smooth brome grass actually lose their nutritional quality. And it seems that the animals are picking that up. And then that's one of the drivers of, of shifting their selectivity towards aspen as you get later into the summer. So we've done a lot of work thinking about fire characteristics. And um, I, here's some work that we've done looking at how fire severity influences uh, susceptibility of aspen uh, to browse pressure. So this is a fire that occurred on uh, Twitchell Canyon in central Utah in 2011. And if you look at the fire severity map, you can see that there's a mosaic of severity, a patchwork across this landscape in which we have areas in red that experienced high burn severity where there was 100% um, overstory mortality of the existing uh, forest stand. Um, there's, a, there's an ash layer and um, moderate severity shown here in yellow. Uh, you get overstory mortality between 30 and 70 percent, but you still have a lot of uh, overstory trees that live. And then uh, low severity. Uh, you get very little overstory mortality, but the, the flames do work their, uh, themselves through the forest stand and, and modify things, um, but 
it's much different, the post environment, uh, fire environment of a low or moderate severity burn compared to a high severity burn. And we're really interested as the aspen regenerate uh, in these post disturbance environments with different burn severity, how does that influence their susceptibility to herbivory? And what we found is that um, browse severity is much lower in moderate and high severity burn environments um, compared to low and unburned uh, environments. And so the question is, well, why is that the case? Well, one thing that we found, uh, we found that deer um, in, in this study system were, were more important than elk and cattle. And we found that deer were spending more time in unburned and, and low severity burn areas uh, relative to moderate high severity burn areas. So they're choosing to spend time um, in areas that haven't experienced high burn severity. And we think that cover um, and predator-prey relationships play, play a role there. And the other thing that seems to be important is that aspen changes its expression of defense compounds based on burn severity. Um, so what we're looking at here is the expression of phenolic glycosides in the top graph here and the expression of condensed tannins. And as a function of burn severity environment. So unburned, low severity, moderate, high severity burns. And what we find is that in early summer, there's no difference in expression as a function of burn severity. But as you progress towards uh, late summer, the uh, aspen suckers that are regenerating in high burn severity environments are expressing much higher levels or concentrations of defense compounds. And so we think that the, the, uh, the, this a higher level of defense as a function of, of defense chemistry expression is also something that's uh, deterring the, the herbivores. Um, so here's just a quick conceptual model that, that outlines some data that I haven't had time to show you. So we're looking at a burn severity gradient and how aspen responds to burn severity. I didn't show you this data. What I can tell you is that vertical growth and the biomass of, of aspen is much higher in high burn severity environments. Um, aspen regeneration density is much thicker, much, much denser in high uh, severity burn environments. I've just shown you that they're better defended in these environments. And the outcome of this is that in high burn severity environments, we see less browse pressure on aspen. We're also really interested in the question of how fire size influences uh, aspen uh, regeneration success uh, in, against herbivores. So this is an experiment uh, where we looked at 25 different fires that have occurred historically in the state of Utah between 10 and 20 years ago. Here's a very large fire down in southern Utah you can see. And then we had five, this was a fire that was more than 70,000 acres and then we have fires that are less than 1,000 acres and everything in between. And when we characterized fire size and the regeneration in response to the aspen, we found a positive relationship between fire size and aspen's regeneration response, which suggests that, that fire size matters as, as well as a burn severity. So here's a, a decision key for resilience in, in mixed aspen uh, conifer wildlife habitat conditions. And, and what we know is that fire characteristics matter. Uh, fire severity matters and fire size, they're critical. Um, so, so, so bigger fires and more severe fires, based on our data, create a more resilient condition for aspen to regenerate. Um, this makes sense. If you have a larger landscape and aspen's regenerating, then there can be a saturation effect of the browse community where they simply can't consume everything. The second thing that's important is how much aspen is in the landscape. Um, so the Yellowstone fires in 2000, or 1988 were very large and very severe, and yet over the, the, the time since the fire, a willow and aspens regenerated very poorly, and a lot of that's been driven by herbivore pressure. Um, and so even though that was a large fire, high burn severity, um, aspen is low, uh, of low abundance in that landscape, and so the ungulate community can really focus in on these patches where the aspen and the willow are located and create severe browse damage. And we've seen evidence of this at our most southern site. Um, 
where uh, the, the ungulate populations are actually not very high, but we're having aspen regeneration failure because the aspen there is not abundant. It's very patchy, and so the animals seem to be concentrating on it. Uh, this uh, third um, recommendation is anecdotal at this point. Um, what, what we found in 2014 was actually a less of, of, of aspen herbivore pressure than we saw in 2013, uh, and less than we expected. And we think part of that's driven by the fact that we had good monsoonal precipitation in the summer of 2014 that extended into the fall. That uh, more precipitation allows aspen to grow vertically more quickly, and it also allows for, for greater forage production of other forage species and extends the phenology or the growing season for those, uh, those other forage species. And so we think that what happened is that there was more forage uh, for, for the ungulates in 2014, and the, the availability of that forage was, was extended and more nutritious later into the season, and so it diverted some of the focus of, of, of these ungulates uh, from the aspen to, to some of these other forage sources. Which suggests that in drought years, aspen uh, may, may receive a lot more focus. And so that's just something we're thinking about and, and we'll be doing more studies to, to, to look at. And then finally, as Rick has pointed out, um, the, the livestock and wildlife uh, population densities, the activity of the critters absolutely matter. And our data suggests that it's really in this Oct uh, August, September period where things are really happening which gives us an opportunity to identify ecological conditions in terms of fire uh, characteristics and also um, when the timing is important so that we can be more targeted in our management approaches so that we can say, okay, this is a, a small fire, it was low severity in an area where we know we have lots of wildlife and, and livestock late in the summer, that's, that's an area that's probably very prone to, to aspen regeneration failure. Um, and outcomes that are, that are problematic. So those, those are the, the, the things that we're really thinking about. I think we have really good evidence uh, for the first two, and, and uh, well, I've got this label as one. We have for, for the one and two, and then the, the livestock and wildlife community structure, I think we have a really good handle on that now, and then we're really interested in moving forward in, in tying in climate, um, precipitation patterns, and how, how that influences what goes on. So I'll go ahead and end there. Great, Sam. Thanks a lot. Um, there's a couple questions here for you. So, how did you arrive yeah, at the so count of animals look at, with at your data? The assuming themselves, you do some of that. individuals, which I'm um, pretty sure you trying didn't. to just look at characteristics of these animals, or just re-entering um, the plots. For our purposes, uh, we're really interested in activity or use. And so, if animals are coming uh, and going and coming back, then then that that's part of the, of the use equation. Okay. Um, oh yeah, we did. So we did were have the one only livestock where present were sheep the cattle, came through, or were sheep came goats through, also grazed in these stands? Uh, in a flood, and just really created a lot of damage in a very short period of time. Um, so, uh, with that exception, it was almost entirely cattle. Um, I have not. No. Okay, and have you observed aspen herbivory by domestic or feral horses? And Rick had a question, what do you think is the mechanism linking burn severity to expression of defense? Is, is it linked to how severity affects density and shading, for example? Oop, there you are. Did you hear that question? Oh, is this, okay, I'm here. Sorry. We might have lost Sam. This is from Rick. Yeah, yeah, I can see. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, we, I don't know if you two things that, that have been correlated Rick's with the, the, the burn severity okay, okay. uh, mechanistically. Um, first of all, we, we thought that, that soil resources, so you get a high burn severity, that, that 
you, you basically get a fertilization effect where you get more nutrients in the soil and, and more nutrients means more photosynthetic capacity and these defense compounds are products of byproducts of, of uh, photosynthesis. Um, but, but that didn't seem to be the case. When we really looked at it, it was, it was a higher light environment where you open up the canopy, you get higher uh, light penetration, aspen is shade intolerant, does not like shade and um, there, there seemed to be a strong correlation between uh, light levels and higher defense chemistry expression for phenolic glycosides, which is interesting because I know that some of Rick's data, uh, some of, of which he showed in this webinar, suggests that um, there, there's not a lot of induction of uh, phenolic glycosides in response to variable light levels. Um, so we have our cameras up there the year-round now. This is the first year we've been able to do that, uh, get the cameras up and functioning during the cold winter months. And so our, our browse data up to this point has, has simply been going in to the, during the spring as early as we can and uh, trying to capture what's going on. So you can see here, um, we got there on May 5th to get the Maristrum removal data. And we're trying to get in even earlier, but these are high elevation sites with lots of snow. And um, so, so what we have here is probably residual browsing from 2013. And separating that out from spring browsing is, is, is difficult at this point. And we are trying to, to get the cameras up there and functioning and getting up there as early as possible to actually try to, try to separate those. Uh, the, the previous fall browse impact um, relative to the, the current year spring browse impact. My guess is that uh, spring may, may be another period where the, there's really a focus before the other forage species come out where they're focusing on the aspen. Uh, 